Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. Tonight, part two of my conversation with Pete Hamill, a chat four years ago on the centennial of Frank Sinatra's birth and the republication of Hamill's book, Why Sinatra Matters. How did you first meet Frank Sinatra? I was covering a fight for the New York Post in uh, Las Vegas. Um, and Jimmy Cannon, the great sports mm. writer, yeah. sports columnist, who I knew from New York, uh, got me at ringside. He said, after you file, he had this <laughs> wonderful New York accent, after you file, meet us over in the room there. It's over near the end, or whatever it was. So I did, and when I, after I filed, I went down to see Cannon, and there was Sinatra at the at this table, and Leo DeRocher, the former yeah. manager of both the Dodgers and the, the Giants, Giants sure. and Dean Martin, and they had all either come to watch the fight and were now retiring to the dressing room. <laughs> and it, we just I just joined them, and I had learned already as a reporter um, don't talk, listen. Listen, yeah. You know? And, and what I, did you hear as you listened? That I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it went from about four minutes on the fight to, you know, the meaning of life in uh, American middle age, you know? There were a few adult beverages on the table, I imagine? Yes, there were. Okay. I had not yet given up drinking, but I had almost done it. Uh, and I just sat there listening to them, and, and uh, I liked Sinatra. What, what impression were you able, if you were able to form one of him in that, in that short time? I, I don't know. He, I remember there was some conversation about both Cannon and I being high school dropouts, as mm. Sinatra was a high right, school dropout. Right. So it was a group that included people... Um, uh, Similar background. Who, who had gone a few innings in spite of, not because. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. you know we... Cannon had gone off and become a, a very good war correspondent and came back and, and became a great sports writer. Um, he and I went to the same uh, Jesuit high school, Regis. Regis, sure. I lasted two years, he lasted one. I didn't even get in. I went to Fort and Brown. Well, then you know what it was like. Jesuit, sure. Uh, uh, I learned a lot in two years, but uh, I didn't realize I'd learned as much as I did until I grew up. Well, it seems yeah. you must have made an impression on, on Sinatra at that first uh, uh, meeting because afterwards when he would come to New York, he or the call. next time he came to New York, perhaps, he, he would call you. Yeah, I became one of his New York friends. I never went out and stayed at his house. He never certainly came and stayed at mine. Uh, but he would call, uh, you know, if he was doing a series of concerts or a big yeah. show of some kind. And uh, he'd call usually around 11.30 and say, did you eat yet? <laughs> you know. At uh, night, <laughs> we're talking. <laughs> And then I, off I'd go, and there was always a group, because I think Sinatra, as um, as a boy, uh, was an only child. Right. So at a time when the immig early in the century, at a time when immigrants' families like his were having yeah, or like mine, loads of I children. was the oldest of seven, sure. so which was normal. Right for working class ethnic types uh, at the time. And so he recognized that somehow. He, he I, I, I think Cannon brought it up 
in at, at a ta late night table, and we started talking about education for right. a, for a while. And Sinatra was also most most of his ink, his publicity, never got into this. But he was a reader because he was. Uh, uh, a guy who had trouble sleeping at night, which mm. was also true of Cannon. So they would sometimes, the, the Insomniacs Anonymous, would call each other at three o'clock in the morning and talk about what they would read. You know, it was, uh, it was Cannon, for example, who uh, told Sinatra about this book written by Nelson Algren called The Man with the Golden uh -huh. Arm, yeah. which became one of Sinatra's best movies. Right. Uh, so they did care about certain things that most, you know. I don't the, think that's in the public consciousness no. about Sinatra, that he was a uh, that reader, he was a reader. That, he, yeah. did, that he thought about things like yeah. in, in that way. No, uh, uh, and yet not surprising once you got to know him. You know, if you got to know him a little bit, uh, you'd understand that uh, that as a self essentially self-educated man, uh, he was looking for certain things. He was looking for meaning. He was looking for location, where, how do I fit into this tale? Mm. Um, particularly after he became an almost legendary figure of, uh, after the great comeback after, uh, in the years after the war. Right, in the 50s. Yeah, yeah. you know, after Ava Gardner. <laughs> right. I'm uh, wondering, uh, just for a moment, uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say Sinatra didn't care for or get along too well with reporters, with newspaper men. And yet you talk about a friendship with you, Jimmy And with Cannon. Cannon. And uh, How, later on with Sidney Zion, mm -hmm. who we liked very much because he was from Jersey, yeah. Sidney. So there was a kind of... What do you think he, he saw in you that allowed him, I guess, to trust you? Uh, you know, I, it, it's, it's hard to say that. I uh, I think he he realized that he could say or do certain things in my presence that were not going to end up in the paper the next day. I wasn't. Uh, my ambition in life was not to be Lee Mortimer. Mm. I wanted to be the, the the best I could be in the only life I was ever going to have. Lee the Mortimer was one of the most reviled uh, yeah. columnists in Hollywood. Yeah, he was the guy that that was in the Daily Mirror on Walter Winchell's day off. <laughs> you know, and his mentality reflected that. I didn't know him at all, but I, I read the column. And Lee Mortimer was famously belted in the mouth by Sinatra at one point. So there was something that brought out the Hoboken street kid in him. In well, the, the book is called Why Sinatra Matters, and why he matters, I think most of all, obviously, is the music. What did you hear in, in the music? When I first heard it, which was immediately after the war, when I was, I was 10, the year the war ended, uh, when I began to hear Sinatra on Martin Block huh. on the radio. W N E W. Uh, uh, I could not define why I liked it. And I could not define why I preferred it to Bing Crosby. <laughs> Even though my father was a huge Bing Crosby fan sure. as an Irish American. I, naturalized uh, American. But uh, later I under began to understand it better. Um, 
Sinatra was urban. It was a city music, the way he did it, the way he created a language of human emotion. Um, he also had learned from Billy Halliday, born in the same year as he was, um, from her music, that you could take the music written by someone else, by Rogers and Hart or one of the Gershwins and whoever it was, and turn it into autobiography by the directness of the, of the emotional commitment to, the, to those words. Uh, and that was for a young kid uh, in an era when working class kids were taught not to express emotion, not to show feeling, mm. you know, that there was a way that you could express feeling and be a man too. There was a way to do that. And I, he changed that for Americans, particularly city Americans. You talk about the, the turning lyrics into autobiography. One, one gets the feeling of listening to Sinatra, much of his music, that it's a conversation between you and him, or it's a conversation he's that's, having that's with his true. emotions. That's true, and it's as unscripted mm. as a conversation. In other words, you can't have a conversation if you got the notes in your back pocket. But So even though he took these words of songs written, what we now call the Great American Songbook, the classical pop music of the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, it, he, he delivered it as if it was written the afternoon before um, and that he had something to do with writing it, which he almost never did. Um, and that was an extraordinary shift in our music. But I think it all, there were also the other things um, that he changed in such important ways. The nature of, of an Italian-American. You know, he was not the organ grinder with the monkey coming down Mulberry Street and begging for nickels. He wasn't that. You know, he was the son of those streets. He had come off those streets. And so he changed the, he along with Fiorella LaGuardia and Joe DiMaggio with the other contemporaries at the time, were a different kind of Italian American. It was not the immigrant off the boat who couldn't read his own name. Uh, it was a guy who off the street is hip and knowing about uh, those streets as anybody in the city. And I think that was a huge uh, a, a, a huge shift, shift that went beyond the music. Could not have happened without the music, but it moved it past it. So it moved, moved the consciousness of the country past just the music uh, into something larger. He was fiercely proud of his of his of his um, heritage, and and I'm, I'm, I think at one point wasn't it Harry James wanted him to change his name? Yes. To to uh, Frankie Satin, <laughs> and 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 Sinatra was having none of that. He said, "It's Sinatra. I'm Frank Sinatra." Yeah. And Harry James back down. Yeah. And it was a crucial moment because he was not pretending to be somebody. He was saying, I am somebody. You know, it was a, you know, uh, a moment, I think, in the formation of his adult character because he was only, what, 
21 or something, 22, when the Harry James thing yeah. happened. And Harry James ended up respecting him for it because he insisted that his name was, as he said, Frank blank blank Sinatra. Yeah, that's <laughs> the way he said it. It's Frank fill in the blank. Yeah. In Sinatra. Yeah. I, I, do you think we'd be sitting here talking today if we were talking about the music of Frankie Satin? I, I can't imagine that. <laughs> no, no. I can't, I can't imagine that. You mentioned he's an, he's an only child, unusual for immigrant families. And there seemed to be a loneliness yes. about him. You can hear it in so much of his music. Yeah, even when he, t when he remembers, he's several times told the story of how when he was growing up in Hoboken, he would take walks down to the water and could look and see the skyline of New York and think, I got it, I can do that, mm. I can do that. Um, he had no one to talk to, no older brother, no, you know, younger cousin or anything that, that he could share. That kind of a vision of himself. Uh, I, I hate the notion of, of the phrase American dream because dreams are unwilled. But certainly what Sinatra and the best of all the immigrants have done is is envision something that through will and work and sacrifice they made real and Sinatra made it real I mean that's why I, I the only reason I get into two of the women Nancy uh, and uh, Nancy and, and Ava Gardner uh, they affected the music and Nancy would say you can do this Frank you know First wife. Yeah, first wife. So she shared the vision that he was more than just a skinny malink from Hoboken. Uh, he had some larger uh, vision of himself. And Ava certainly affected the music as, uh, I guess yeah. it was Nelson Riddle who said of her, uh, she taught him how to. She taught him how to sing a, a torch song. Yeah, and uh, the hard way. And I'll tell you, years later. I think it was thirteen, fourteen years after they divorced. I interviewed Ava Gardner. She was in New York. Hmm. Uh, and I went to visit her at. Uh, like 11 o'clock in the morning one morning. And she was staying in Frank Sinatra's apartment at the Waldorf Astoria. So that was a friendship uh, that had endured a lot of pain, uh, but was still in some ways meaningful to Frank. Uh, he he never spoke about it. He never certainly said anything embarrassing to the other people in his life. Uh, but he was still friends with this woman, beautiful as she was, uh, who loved him in some way as he loved her, but it was one of those... One of those things. One of those things that does not work, you know? <laughs> Let's talk about the music in terms of some of the themes you've been touching on. Loneliness. Resilience. Resilience. The stoic sort of thing, you know. Don't worry about me, I'll get along. Yeah. You know, that was a note that hadn't been sounded before uh, by male singers. Um, it said, you know, Yes, we had a great time, but it's over, and I'm going to go I, look for a cab now. <laughs> you know. You knocked me down, but yeah, I'm getting up. Yeah, I'm from people that get up. Yeah. You know. 
Well, there was so much of that in the in the early the the, the Nelson Riddle years in those yeah, songs. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. They for me those are the my favorites, and because I think there's something that Riddle got about Sinatra, both his voice and his emotional power uh, that nobody had quite located before. And what, the, what are some of those songs that stand from that? We're talking the well, my middle, favorite early, now, middle 50s. Now that I'm 80, my favorite is You Make Me Feel So Young. <laughs> 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 But there, there was a. The more you listen to them, you find layers of, of uh, emotion. Sometimes it can be casual. Sometimes it is. It's never full of contempt. You know, he might break up with a woman, or she break up with him, uh, and regret it. Um, but he, he never attacks her. He never says, you bitch, I'm going to have a life. He, he steps back and in a, in a kind of wounded way, um, but remains an individual without callous around his heart. Do you have some favorite uh, songs or albums? I I like the the We Small Hours album. I like the Bossa Nova, the oh, Jodim we, album. Yeah, Jobim. Jobim. Uh, we Small Hours is many musicologists have referred to it as perhaps the best. Yeah. Album. But he, when he does ever. when he does the light stuff. Tony, the the up tempo stuff, the celebratory kind of pieces. He's also wonderful. He, he there's a kind of exuberance in it. So I like Nice and Easy, mm. uh, the album. Yeah, you know, because he the, he was lucky that uh, when he started that phase of his career, the LP was beginning to form so you could have a kind of unity of theme. Right, concept yeah. albums. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he sort of yeah. invented them. Or yeah, and uh, you can still play them at two o'clock in the morning if you, if uh, you can't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> he asked you to write his bio. He did. And, and, and you agreed, and but it didn't work out. I, I, I sort of agreed. I started to talk with them about it, you know, and about different. I said, you know, the certain things would have to be in it, because I didn't want to just rent out my fingers. Uh, uh, what certain things? The women. Yeah, the w women, the mob. Um, the losses, because we all get through life with a certain number of losses. What did he say about what you felt had to be in? He there? said, uh, uh, he said, the women, I love them all. He said, uh, the things that happen at two o'clock in the morning, you can't get around it. But there's certain things, if I said anything, someone will come knocking at my door. <laughs> but then the next day, he called me and he said, he, meaning the mob guys. Right. Uh, the next day he called me and said, what the hell? Oh, most of them were all dead. By then, Luciano was dead and, you know, various guys that he knew when he was young. But his his explanation of the mob thing was that when he was a young singer, he was a saloon singer. And he said to me, he said, I didn't meet any Nobel Prize winners in those saloons. 
Pete, the last page of your book is, is very moving. Would you read that for us? We were crossing 86th Street, heading for Central Park. You think some people are smart and they turn out dumb, Sinatra said. You think they're straight, they turn out crooked. This was the Watergate winter. The year before, Sinatra, the old Democrat, sat in an honored place at the second inauguration of Richard Nixon. The Watergate tapes would reveal a Nixon who retailed crude anti-Italian slurs. You like people, Sinatra said softly, and they die on you. I go to too many goddamn funerals these days. And women, he said, exhaling and then chuckling again. I don't know what the hell to make of them. Do you? <laughs> I said that every day I knew less. Maybe that's what it's all about, he said. Maybe all that happens is you get older and you know less. I liked the man who talked that way on a chilly night in New York. I liked his doubt and his uncertainty. He had enriched my life with his music since I was a boy. He had confronted bigotry and changed the way many people thought about the children of immigrants. He had made many of us wiser about loss and human loneliness. And he was still trying to understand what it was all about. His imperfections were upsetting. His cruelties were unforgivable. But Frank Sinatra was a genuine artist and his work will endure as long as men and women can hear and ponder and feel. In the end, that's all that truly matters. Pete Hamill and Frank Sinatra came of age on city streets. Hamill's writing and Sinatra's songs gave the American city a voice. We will hear that voice always.